We've covered the evolution of the Mauser rifles up until the Model 1887, but now it's time to make the jump to smokeless powder and the first modern Mauser. Hi, I'm Othias, and this, oh, this is big, and a little rough, uh, this is the Belgian Fossi 1889, the first smokeless powder Mauser. Now, I'm going to send something to the light box, but this one really isn't in the greatest shape, so let's get one that I photographed up at Springfield instead. Weighing in at 9.3 pounds and with an overall length of 50 inches, this is a large infantry style rifle. It has a magazine capacity of 5, fed from a stripper clip. That is the 765 Mauser cartridge. Yeah, I'll show you more when we get close in, but there's a couple little tack repairs and stuff on this gun. They are not factory original, but it's in shooting condition. It's actually a very good shooter. And a lot of the wear on it, as we'll see, is very appropriate for the war. Uh, this is actually going to be a triple set of episodes. I meant for it to be a double, but as I started writing, I realized that there's a lot of context, and we have a fair number of guns for you to see from this family of rifles before we get further into the Mauser line. And I know that a lot of people really care about the Mauser lineage. We're going to go into the detail. So if you're one of those people that likes to comment that we have a little too much potato and not enough meat when we talk about these rifles, you may want to start skipping around now because we are going to do a lot of contextual history on Belgium, Mausers, and everything else so that you understand this inside out. We'll start with the city of Liège, which was settled along the Meuse River in the valley of the same name. It was a hub at the center of an iron and coal-rich region still known today as the Black Hill Country. This of course made it perfect for weapons manufacture. The first known references to arms making dates back to 1346, but it likely could have been sooner than that. So for centuries, Liège would support long family lines of skilled metal workers and, for our purposes, lineages of armament manufacturers. Guilds formed, skills honed, and passed down, and through generations this became one of the world's great cottage industry towns. But then came the Industrial Revolution, which was actually slower than most people realize. It came creeping on in over decades, not overnight like many assume. Now, because the influence of the Industrial Revolution was actually fairly slow to gear up, Things like guild systems really had the ability to sort of build a buffer, to sort of push out that influence and hold it back as long as possible because nobody really wants to wipe out what is already their cash cow. And so you would see Liège remain fairly insular to the advances in the rest of the world, off and on actually throughout its history. Now, a lot of this did change, however, because of the 1830 secession of Belgium from the Netherlands. In this case, they got their own king. This guy had been offered the Greek crown, but thought that seemed way too unstable. Good thing he held out because he got an oven-fresh Belgian kingdom. Leopold was a Protestant and modernist. He would model Belgium on the English pattern of industrialization in order to drive economic and technological growth. He would set up the rhythm for breaking up old world Belgian guild and trade systems whenever they threatened advancement. He kept government away from regulating business but also granted capital to entrepreneurs who might grow the nation as a whole. Following his death, his son Leopold II would carry things even further. Even more the capitalist, Leopold II's reign would see Belgium become the fifth largest economy in the world. He's also a somewhat notorious man for seeking Belgian colonies in the Congo and taking them for his own personal profit. Despite committing atrocities against the local peoples in pursuit of resource harvesting like natural rubber, he managed to be recognized as a humanitarian all while doing this. Leopold II is another one of those men that have proven that you can do great and terrible things at the same time. And I'm not just bringing it up to malign him because the Belgian Congo did a lot to bring imports of especially rubber and then other useful materials into the country. Now, if you're curious about just the Congo part about that, there is a book called Leopold's Ghost. I highly recommend reading it. It is a bit depressing. Uh, anyway. 
Belgium industrially definitely profited from that importation under Leopold in a way that it wouldn't have if it didn't have a colony. And that's worth mentioning because all these resources being available to an area like Liège, in addition to their own natural resources, well, that starts to build up a very good crafting system and a lot of good technology. And so as we start to kind of get into the 1850s and 60s, maybe 70s, we start to see some very familiar names even today for a lot of people. Now, while you may know some of these, I guarantee you you're not associating them with the sort of powerhouse production of Colt or Winchester or Remington. Instead, um, these guys are generally known as skilled craftsmen with a lot of almost one-off, maybe some serial production guns that are mostly hand-fit. We're not talking about true interchangeable parts. These guys are home and family factory guys. So maybe they've set up a facility that employs 20 odd people to 50 odd people. And that's pretty good at that time, but as we know, there's many more opportunities out there. And so uh, unlike in the US in the frontier where you could sort of start marketing to everybody in this big broad way and build up a big sort of central column industry, Liège had names and guilds and trade and all sorts of certifications that they had sort of inbuilt. And, you know, the families had almost treaties with each other in a way. And so what you start to see is when big opportunities roll in, well, they would band together to form little consortiums to get the job done. One such occasion would be the Crimean War, in which the British would order 20,000 Enfield pattern rifles. This resulted in groups of workshops pooling together in order to get those contracts and deliver the material. We'll see this again with the Comblains for the Belgian government, Chassepots for the French, and Snyders for the Ottomans. And most importantly today, the Dutch Beaumont. In 1887, a number of smaller companies would form Les Fabricants d'Armes Réunis, and I'm sorry I don't speak French, to handle conversion of 30,000 Dutch Beaumont rifles into Vitali repeater magazines. And now as cool as these consortiums are, these firms were usually not making arms for the Belgian government itself. That was handled by Manufacture de Arms de l'État, or MAE for short. Established by royal decree in November of 1837, the land was purchased in 1838. MAE provided arms, repair, vocational classes, and inspection and acceptance of said arms purchased for the Belgian government. It supplied the army, gendarmerie, and guards civique, and was not allowed to produce for foreign powers. Now, because MAE couldn't really compete for foreign contracts with domestic producers, that kept the Liège guilds in good business. So that's where Belgium sort of was. I know this is a bit hurried and a bit narrow of perspective, but we got a lot of ground to cover. So Liège, uh, guild style gunsmith families with family factories, occasionally banding together to make big contracts. Okay. And they would form these uh, coalitions and then dissolve them whenever things were done because nobody wanted an overarching giant power in there that was bigger than any of the other families. And then you have uh, MAE, who is producing the guns for the government in larger batches. A lot of this probably had to do with the fact that while the government could buy 20,000 rifles off of one of these unions, if it dissolves, somebody's got to be responsible for maintenance thereof, and they don't want to sign a bunch of little contracts. I can't be sure, but I really suspect that's why this got going. So, uh, MAE is responsible for making sure the government gets what it needs. It can, on occasion, by the way, contract to the smaller guys to get lots of stuff done. It's just the organizing body for government purchases. All right, that gets us to the Belgian system, as we understand it, around about 1885, which is when our story really gets interesting. And what, by the way, at this point, was Belgium using to actually shoot when they did shoot at people? Well, they were still fielding the Albini Braidlin and the more updated rifle was the Comblain, both large bore black powder single shot rifles. Now there had been attempts to convert the Comblain into a magazine rifle, but those were dreadful failures. Honestly, Belgium had been fishing around at a somewhat leisurely pace for a new rifle since 1880, but it was slow going. And in 1885, a representative from Antwerp demanded a better gun for the Belgian military. And the Minister of War, General Pontus, decided that it was time to get something done. He told MAE, go ahead and set up a series of trials. We're actually getting a new rifle. These began in 1886 and featured names like Kropacek, Frankot, Yarman, Schulhoff, Remington, and Nagant. We've seen a lot of these in our series so far, actually. But only the Remington, specifically the Remington Lee, survived this first wave of inspection. The Belgians favored the central vertical magazine, 
but they disliked the complicated assembly of the overall rifle, uh, and so it too was technically eliminated, but they did like the magazine. Belgian officials realized that they weren't probably going to be able to just adopt a new rifle wholesale. Uh, to get what the Belgians wanted, they were probably going to have to urge inventors to go along certain avenues. They're going to have to start saying, we want this sort of magazine system exclusively. I understand your rifle doesn't have it. Tough. Put it on there. Uh, we want this sort of layout for the bayonet. I understand your rifle doesn't have it. Tough. Put it on there. And so this is a system we've seen before. It actually becomes more common around this same period for a lot of countries. So a good example of a trial that follows this one that does the same sort of thing to a much greater degree would be our Mosin episode in which the government got very involved in just picking and pulling pieces and parts from two big names and blending them together into exactly what they wanted. Now Belgium didn't go that far, but they did say we want a big hand in this. And so that started to thin down the number of inventors. Early on, the big names would be Nagant, Ferdinand Monlicker, Henri Piper, and Joseph Schulhoff. Our boy is not even on the stage yet. Now these guys packed in their rifles and they were put through some pretty harsh trials. Endurance, firing, dust and sand, uh, rust and water. We've said this stuff before. It's, it's the usual, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, I believe Ian over at Forgotten Weapons has an article on his site if you'd like to see some more. Uh, but generally, we treated them rough, we treated them wet, and we uh, purposely sabotaged ammunition and put it in there to see what would happen. And when the dust sort of settles from all this, realistically, one name is standing above the rest, and that is going to be Monlicker, the gun already adopted in Austria-Hungary. This would remain the case through 1887, and during that same year, Belgium would be glad their program had dragged on a bit, because that's when the French revealed the Labelle. Small bore, smokeless powder. We've talked about this rifle often as it was revolutionary, practically doubling the effective range of the infantrymen of the day and doing away with all that fouling and the position revealing smoke. Once this baby was on the scene, there was really no point in a large bore black powder cartridge, and so a lot of the parallel development of ammunition in the Belgian trials was tossed out. The emergence of the Labelle rifle really had an effect on the trials. It caused an almost year-long pause because Everybody had to go to their separate corners and figure out what they were going to do with this. In the meantime, uh, they introduced an 8mm rimmed cartridge. Uh, I don't know a lot of details on this thing, and I'm unsure if it was even truly smokeless. It was probably, uh, you know, a compressed black powder charge high speed. Um, at the time, uh, everybody was scrambling to get a hold of smokeless formulas, and not always coming up strong until about 1890, so eh, tricky. But uh, they want to simulate smokeless as best they could uh, and just ignore the fouling consequences of using a small board because they knew that it, once they had the powder, we'd have the powder. Or maybe Belgium got lucky and France gave them some powder early on. I've been unable to figure out that little nuance of all this. But regardless, 8mm rimmed trials cartridge. Uh, everybody has to go back and come up with an action that can handle a smokeless powder and work around all those principles. And so we don't see things kick back up until 1888. By November, things were back up and running. The Monlicker was still in, as was a Piper design, along with a Piper Monlicker rifle that seems to borrow from the Gewehr 1888, perhaps a precursor to the later Romanian rifles we saw. There was still a Nagant rifle, we'll see this one passed on to our Mosin episode, and the Ligeoisie, or the Ong rifle. Uh, Ian has a video on this one, you should go check it out. The Schulhof was still going, plus a new contender, this Model 1888 from Paul Mauser in Germany. Hey, that's our guy! Alright, so Paul Mauser's on the scene, which means we kind of have to do another review, because unless you've been watching all of our Mauser episodes, you're probably at a loss for who this guy is and what's going on. Long ago, we did an episode on the Gewehr 98, and in truth, it was a bit premature, but we didn't have the resources then that we do now. So, we've restarted the Mauser family way back at the 1871, proceeding through the 1880, albeit briefly, we never got one in our hands, and the 7184 and the Ottoman 1887. Just a reminder, these were all accomplished by the Mauser brothers. They had come up from near poverty to sell their own inventions, starting a small workshop, then buying their own factory to make parts for the guns they had designed, then finally selling the whole guns. Now reduced to just the brother Paul Mauser, he secured a huge Ottoman contract to finally seal his success, just as Ludwig Lova bought out the bank, and his company in the process. This was a huge blow to the man, but it gets worse. 
With the introduction of the LaBelle, everyone had rushed to develop their own smokeless rifles. Distracted by the Ottoman contract, Paul Mauser wasn't consulted at home, and so Germany released the Gewehr 1888. They probably should have consulted Mauser because this gun had issues. You could fire it without a bolt head, barrels were splitting, and double feed detonations were fairly common. It got so bad that it spawned a wave of anti-Semitism in the arms industry, prompting Ludwig Lova to become Deutsche Waffen and Munition Fabriken. Now if you're a fan of the show, you already know all of that. I just want to make sure I filled people in on Mauser's current and pertinent fury when he designed what was going to be his smokeless powder rifle because he was going to crush the Gewehr 88 and he was going to seal his name forever in history. And so he came up with, well, something rather interesting. His gun used a central box magazine like the Lee, removable and possibly used for loading. This was a single column of nine rounds, uh, and the follower arm actually allowed for an external lever. It allowed the follower to be lowered for single shot use, and it also gave a visual indicator of how many rounds remained in the magazine. The ejection port was narrow and set at the top for strength. It was sealed against dirt when the bolt was closed thanks to a top rib, which also set over the extractor, kind of like the later Krag Jorgensen. Apparently when the magazine was removed, a spring action sealed that resulting cavity and allowed for single shot use with no magazine. Also, note the bolt is rear locking at this point in the process and is using rimmed 7.65 millimeter ammunition. Anyway, this round of testing sort of failed across the board. It seems there was a problem with the test ammunition. Again, very early days for this stuff. And so everybody kind of washed out together, except the Monlicker and the Mauser still kind of stood out regardless. All right, so in this point in the trials, you're noticing there's not a lot of domestic names. I mean, Frank Cod had put forward a, like a martini design, and that's a single shot. That's weird. Um, there's a few native names that have turned up here and there, but I can't find example guns to this point. Some show up later that get sort of photographed or at least held on to the modern day. But domestic Belgian designs are not doing so hot. Um, Liège is not bringing their air game to this process. And so this is causing some problem because, you know, in the era of nationalism, people want a Belgian gun for the Belgians. And so if they can't adopt a Belgian gun, they definitely need to produce it at home. Problem there. MAE really has only been doing like repair work for quite a while and the last gun they really made was probably the Albini. I gotta do some more research there. MAE is not set up to do modern, interchangeable part, high quality, good polished manufacturing. Um, and for them to do that, they would really need to step up their game and improve their manufacturing to the tune of many, many, many dollars. And the governments back then did not like spending money. Uh, I know that's hard to imagine. So, uh, if they weren't going to get it from MAE and they can't just buy the Mauser from Mauser or the Monlicker from OEWG, what are they going to do? Well, we're back to that same old solution. We got to round up the Liège gunsmiths and get them to work together. Specifically, all the guys from the earlier Beaumont contract plus a couple others would form their own consortium to bid on producing the next Belgian rifle before it was even selected. Now, these are some very famous names. You should recognize a fair number of them if you are into old guns. Now, they didn't do it alone. They also had some assistance from MAE itself in getting set up. Now, again, the rifle hasn't been chosen. They're just sure that there's going to be 150,000 ordered and then maybe some on top of that. And that should be happening in the next couple of years once they settle in on what they want. So nuts, let's form our own company. And they did. Uh, they formed their consortium. Uh, it was agreed upon in October of 1888 with a value of 3 million francs in capital. Uh, this was going to be a pretty good little facility, right? Well, now they just need the gun. And that would come along, you know, real progress in the summer of 1889. All right, in this round, we still have the Monlickers. Uh, the Nagas have brought along two rifles. Ligeoisie was still in the fight, and a new local contender, the Marga, had arrived. The Mauser, well, it was pretty different. Shortening up the magazine and fitting it closer to the trigger guard, he had finally found a way to compete head on head with the Monlicker, the stripper clip. This little bit of metal held a pack of cartridges just like OEWG's Unblock. But instead of remaining in the gun, it was just aligned in the receiver and the ammo shoved in place. The clip stayed out. We're pretty familiar with this practice on the show as it would become ubiquitous, but that just reveals how good of an idea it was. Just because you see it everywhere doesn't mean that it was obvious the day it was invented. Now, again, don't forget, before the Monlicker end block clip, you have to single load the tube magazine for the most part in most guns. Uh, if you have a magazine gun, 
There are some rare exceptions, like the slug style Vitali, but generally we're loading one, firing one, or we're loading eight, firing eight, and it's about the same time for both operations. Once we get in the end block clip, though, the reason why everybody was so excited about it, uh, even above like the Labelle, which had smokeless powder, but was still a tube magazine loader, I can load a bunch of rounds at once and then fire them and then load a bunch at once. I'm actually saving time. The downside of that is, well, twofold. One, uh, here, let me go ahead and, ah, you know, I just happen to have exactly what we're talking about here, Mon Liquor 1886 from an earlier episode. Let's get a closer look. So, uh, ooh, I'm gonna make some space. Aha, and there, okay. Straight pull, wedge locker. We don't need to go into crazy detail. I want you to see two things. One, patented plastic and pokey. There are no feed lips in this system. So if I put a round in there loose down the magazine, it's just gonna flop around. I can set one in for single loading, but there's no way to stack up multiple rounds without an end block clip. The feed lips being attached to the clip, that can be a potential problem because that means that the magazine is only as strong as the clip itself. There's a secondary problem on these early end block clips, one that we don't see with later end block guns like the Garand, but there's, there's a hole right here, okay? And so mud, muck, dirt can enter the action and we can have some real problems. So in general, when Mauser comes up with a system that allows you to cheaply and easily create a five round clip or more, and you can just shove it in the gun, load the whole gun and bolt forward, but there's no open bottom and you get integral feed lips that you can machine however you like. Oh yeah, this is working out a lot better. Now, looking at this rifle again, it did remain rear locking at first, but this quickly gave way to a proper front locking action. Now, he had to make the choice to go to front locking because he had to modify the back of the receiver. Watch this cascade, okay? The gun was originally designed with a small opening port in the top, kind of like our old uh, Beretta pistol, the 1915 that we saw. There's just an oval shape that was almost exactly the size of a cartridge, and you could load in that. Well, what that did is it allowed the receiver to retain most of its metal, as much metal as possible, so that when you fired it, all that pressure that transmits down the receiver would have the most metal reinforcement before it hit the locking lugs all the way at the rear. Well, once we switch over to the stripper clip system, we kind of have a hard time shoving the rounds down in a port that is maybe bigger than our thumb, and a lot of guys have big thumbs, so Mauser had to cut away the side, the right side of the receiver in order to make that stripper clip really work. And in cutting away the right side of the receiver, he opens up a whole quadrant that's going to have problems over time with being stretched by firing. He's gonna have that offside problem that he had with the 71. Remember, the 71 locked just on the right handle, and it became inaccurate over time because that's stretching the receiver. He was not going to repeat this mistake, okay? So once he had to cut away the receiver, he said nuts to that. I'm running the locking lugs all the way up to the front so that they are right there at the explosion with full one, you know, 360 degrees of metal to help them protect and stay true. The other thing that this does, just as an added benefit, is because we don't have the length of the bolt body carrying the load either, well, yeah, the receiver could stretch over time, but the bolt body would compress over time, and both problems combined, well, we're gonna have some uh, precision problems. So, again, less bolt compression with front locking logs, less receiver stretch with front locking logs, harder to machine, but kind of worth it in the long run if you want a very long served guns, and these guns would serve for quite a while. All right, so that is why Mauser had a pretty strong idea of what should be a military rifle at the time, but it doesn't mean that the trials are over yet. At this point, the Belgians had whittled things down to one of the Nagant rifles, the Piper Monlicker Hybrid, or the Mauser. Which would it be? Now, try not to hold me to those drawings in case something comes out in the future. I am mostly consulting notes by Ooh, Anthony van der Linden, who wrote an excellent FN Mauser Rifles book. This is a fairly new book. Uh, it's still out there for original price. I believe it's not in the secondary book market where everything gets expensive yet. Um, if you have a chance, check this out. He also has one on Belgian handguns. We reference them a lot in the show, and let me tell you, it doesn't look like a thick book, but I'm a t we really cut out a lot of the story, and a lot of it is very fascinating, and there's weird little whirlpools of information that you guys would very much love from a book like this. So, um... If you like C and Arsenal, 
I have to produce one of these every other week. So I'm absolutely dependent on actual researchers and authors. These guys are doing the heavy lifting. Get out there this year and try to buy at least one book for yourself to put on your wall to understand history a little bit better and to support the people who do this kind of work. But regardless, Vander Linden believes that what we depicted was the Monlicker Piper hybrid. I have actually seen at least one Italian artillery manual that mentioned the trials that said that the Piper Monlicker was actually a six-shot rotary magazine, which would point to a different rifle that I've also seen photos of. But then, what is the Piper rifle? It, it's a nightmare. Uh, trying to find this stuff out after the fact with barely anything written down, not always easy. So, we're as close as we're going to get, and we already know who's going to win. So, just if five years from now something comes out and you want to come at me for one of my drawings, I'm very sorry. History is alive. Get out and do your own work. It's beautiful. So... We're down to a handful of rifles, and we need to start thinking about producing them as we're adopting them. This starts to get hand in hand, and that means that our friends from the consortium finally show back up in our story here as we're getting to the end of the summer of 1889. They have formed Fabrique Nationale de Armes de Guerre, which agreed to produce 150,000 rifles for the Belgian government at a price of 79 francs a piece with bayonet. This deal was signed July 12th, 1889, and again, no gun has actually been adopted yet. You heard it right, they put a price on a gun that they didn't know what it was yet, and I can guarantee you that means that there must have been a healthy margin either way. But, uh, there's a Belgian producer for their Belgian gun now, mostly. Uh, they are down to basically two designs. They're really honing in on Monlicker versus Mauser. And I don't think I need to beat down the point that the Mauser wins. Uh, overall, when you compare the systems at this point, they both load fast, they both handle the cartridge, but Mauser probably had more locking strength uh, if it was still the old wedge locking Monlicker. I'm unsure if they had started to put in any ideas for rotary, but I doubt it. Um, and so, stronger action, less susceptible to mud, loads just as fast. I mean, this is the Mauser 89. This is the birth of the modern Mauser that we are so accustomed to today. Obviously, it is a good rifle, and obviously, it sweeps the field. From the commission delegates, the Monlicker took only one vote. The Nagant, likely because of nationalism, took two. And the Mauser, five. This would be announced in August of 1889, but there was some minor adjustment to do, plus tooling up for production. Notably, the safety was simplified from that rod we've seen into a wafer. Same effect, much more condensed. Other changes included tweaks to the front and rear sights and an increase in length of the overall gun. There was also the matter of a cartridge. Germany had gone with an 8mm smokeless, rimless design, and it was certainly more modern than the French Lebel. Mauser had put forward his own 7.65 cartridge, rimmed at first, but later rimless. Performance was good, and it's likely in these early days, Belgium did not have a lot of first-hand experience to justify working up their own variant over what was already available. So they would adopt both Mauser's rifle and his cartridge. Now, I don't mean for that to sound like they weren't doing their homework, because uh, Antwerp Pyrotechnics and MAE were working very hard on what cartridge really would be best. It's more than likely that they were looking at an 8mm rimmed cartridge just like they had been in the trials, but when Mauser came along with the rimless 7.65, it functioned better, and realistically, you get some good ballistics out of those 7.65 cartridges. There's no reason not to split the difference between 8mm and what a lot of other countries were looking at, which was down as low as 6mm. So, it's weird. Nowadays, we think of 8mm Mauser as perfectly normal, but if you stop for a moment, 7.65 is 30 cal, and 30 cal has remained consistent all the way up to this day as just a very good diameter for a cartridge. So, saying that they just sort of accepted Mauser doesn't really give away the fact that Mauser had a very good idea, and they went with the very good idea after very much consideration. The bayonet would be a shorter, more modern knife style with a quillion to use in stacking arms. Again, that's when you prop your rifles together in order to keep them out of any mud, snow, or other nastiness in the field. On October 23rd, 1889, King Leopold II would sign the royal decree naming the new Fusil Mauser Model 1889 Belgium's official rifle. And that was this guy right here, because there were no significant modifications to this rifle all the way through World War I. Um, not until they made a different gun. We'll talk about that next time. So, let's go ahead and get a closer look at what would be the 1889. So, zooming in, this guy is very rough. I want you to ignore this little button here. 
And there's actually one on the other side. I'm not sure what happened in this gun's life that it felt like it needed to be repaired this way, but uh, we're not all the way back. I'm putting this guy where it should be, but she works. Now, ignoring those two and the fact that the stock's a little light from sanding, she's gonna do just fine because actually the poor bluing was a consideration during the war. So this bit, not all that uncommon, especially for wartime manufactured guns, although this is not one of those. So let's take a look down the whole thing. We've got a straight wrist, rear sling swivel. We have our trigger and magazine right here. This magazine is pseudo detachable, more on that in a moment. We load from the top with a stripper clip. So uh, I don't have any uh, dummy 765s, but I think you can work your imaginations here. We'd open up the bolt. We'd have this loaded with five rounds. It would insert right here. Notice, by the way, that the spring for the bolt stop lever is actually keeping pressure on that lever, which is extended to make contact and really help hold on to that clip. Now this would prove to not be necessary in later Mausers, but it's kind of neat. You get a nice big purchase point to get that open and you get a little extra spring pressure on your clip. It's just a cool little design. So as we walk her back, we'll see, you know, arm and spring follower, more on that in the animation. I'll bolt her home. As I bolt her home, I want you to notice she is cock on close. So as I bring her open, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find a way for you guys to see this. Watch this cocking piece disappear. See, down in there. It's because she's almost all the way forward until we snag on the sear and bolt her down, at which point she appears cock on close, not like the later cock on open Mausers. So we walk her back. We have a ladder style sliding adjustable rear sight. This is just with a simple pinch. So it doesn't lock into place so much as you just shove it hard and it wants to sort of be where it is. Walking down, you'll notice that we seem to have a very large diameter barrel. Not really though, because that's just our barrel jacket. This is a steel sleeve that's wrapped around the barrel. We saw this on our Gavari 88 episode. And by the way, before this gets to the range, you may notice this. <laughs> this gun is in very rough shape and I'm not sure what uh, cleaning rod this was that somebody shoved in here, but it's not original. However, I like having it here because you can see but there's actually a little keeper to help retain that cleaning rod so it doesn't get lost. And yet, somehow they're almost always missing on these guns. A uh, nice prominent front sight. Oh, and we'll walk her back. So, still a little bit more to go into because we haven't really seen the bolt. Now, while it's still in the gun, I'll show you the flag style safety works just like our previous models. And before I start pulling things apart, I really wanna drive this home. The last Mauser we saw in this series was the 1887. Now this is not uh, John Clear's beauty. This is another one that I happen to have that's in rough and incomplete shape that might get back to its former self one day, but it certainly has enough for us to see what's going on. So let me get this into frame. And I mean, look at where we were, right? So we had a single locking lug here with another one set at the rear of the action that's you probably won't be able to make out clearly on this gun, but it's back under here. We have all this extra metal and material going on to prevent out of battery rotation. And it's all part of our ejection system and everything. We have this little rinky dink extractor over top where our bolt stop is literally just a ring, like just a screwed on ring. That's super not great uh, in terms of high design. We still have though the flag style safety that everybody likes. It just works differently because it's got a shrouded rod that's down in here. Um, and then overall, it's an old black powder gun. We're not worried about the rest of it so much. Magazine cut off in this position, that sort of thing. So take that away and let's look at this. I mean, we're, this is a big jump and the jump is two years. Uh, that's it, two years and you go from what we saw to this with a proper bolt stop, uh, clip loading, front locking lugs, uh, beautifully polished. Look at how smooth and even all this is. And then as I take this bolt out, I want you to really appreciate how simple. So I'm gonna hold this guy back, pull the bolt through. That, by the way, is not just the bolt stop. It also has a central piece that's easier to see in our animation that rides through this split in the lug. That is our ejector as well. So get the rifle out of the way for a moment. On the bolt, look at, look at the simplicity of this. I mean, it's just, it's a single piece bolt body, all milled out of one, no separate bolt head, very strong. Uh, we've got our extractor here. It's just a simple lay-in extractor. We don't see the later super cool Mauser extractor just yet. And then at the rear, we've got a wafer style safety that I showed you previously that's easier to see in the animation. Our caulking piece here, 
nothing fancy, no camming surfaces, no nothing. This is as simple as you can make a Mauser and it's all just screwed together. Well, welcome to the nightmare because there's not really a quote unquote easy way to do this. Um, as a matter of fact, let me oh, grab something, anything to give me a hand and mass is good. Oh, I just happen to have a spam can of ammo. It's dirty. Let's not worry about it too much. Let me just get that in frame where you guys can hopefully see it. All right, so uh, don't have to be a spam can, but the idea is, you know, I need this to be taller. Yeah. Oh. Is that gonna give me enough? Eh, that gives me enough. So here's the nightmare, and I know I'm barely in frame. We need th this guy right here to come all the way back. And then we're going to slip a coin in there between him, the caulking piece, and this uh, caulking shroud. So let me uh, let me just do this real quick. I know it's not in frame, but you guys can watch from the main camera for just a moment while I, this is the most horrifying experience. Oh, I don't have enough length. Ugh. Let me tell you, I'll walk this back where I can do it. Behind the curtain, all right, so everybody who owns an Argentine 1891 knows this pain, right guys? We're all familiar with this. So I've got her separated, I'll put the coin in, and then I'll show you on the camera. Okay, whew. All right, so that's what we're talking about. We've got that guy in there. <laughs> that allows us to go ahead and rotate our bolt body off that sleeve. Hoo-ha. There we go. I can get this monster out of the way. Oh. <laughs> All right. It's easier done with a table edge. Uh, the way I'm set up, everything's padded out for the show, so that was just a nice live edge. So now that we're here, we could further disassemble this by letting our coin loose and going through a huge nightmare of other problems. But realistically, this is where we want to be. So this is not what you would call a easy field repair or treatment, but it is still very simple. Like we just have the firing pin the spring, the collar, the caulking piece, and then the safety mechanism actually is a little complicated in the fact that it does have a detent so that it positively locks. We'll see Mauser try to address this later. The bolt body is one piece of excellent milling. There's our face, which is partly relieved at the bottom. Mauser would later come up with a fully relieved lower face in order to prevent double feeds, but not just yet. Um, and then we have our simple over top extractor. Uh, in this place with the bolt up. Now when we drop her down, she ends up being on the right side. So that is really not terribly complicated. Let me set it aside though, go back to the gun because honestly, this gun is extremely simple. We take it for granted how simple this gun is. Cock on close, one piece bolt body. We're used to the Mauser 98 that came later. This is simpler than the Mauser 98. In a lot of ways, could be more reliable, but those upgrades, we'll see whether or not they count later in another episode. So. While we have this though, I want to point out what is complicated, which is the magazine, because you kind of need a cartridge. Now, uh, we used Spitzer because that ammo was available, but it would have been ball. Uh, I don't think it's a huge difference for our, you know, we're not doing any sort of measurement of the actual speed or anything like that, but realistically this would be ball ammo. So let's go ahead and take a look though as to how we would use this because there's a button Right, let me get patented plastic and pokey. I know some people don't like them, but his translucence really helps when it comes to certain things. Right in here, there's a button. We're going to depress it with our cartridge. And with that button depressed, we will be able to, and this is like trying to do this for the camera, pull our magazine out. So it's not actually that stiff. I'm just trying to keep it remotely in frame for you guys. There we go. So the magazine starts to come out, pull her all the way out. And then boom, there she is. This is a sealed unit as far as you're concerned of in the field. Yes, you can get it further apart than this. No, I would not do it in a trench anywhere. And no, this is not done to load it. This is done for cleaning. This is done for repair. This is not done to load the gun. You don't carry spares of this particular magazine. And it is a fairly complicated mag. You'll see it in Bruno's animation. We've got an armature in here with a couple flat springs and then a you know actual metal follower. This is pretty involved and probably the most complicated thing on the entire gun. Now, while I struggle to get that bolt back together and into this gun, let's go ahead and look at that said animation from Bruno. 
Here's that stripper clip, feeding five into the vertical magazine, which is fairly complicated as we said, and then it has a flat spring powered follower and arm linkage. The bolt is cock on close, catching the sear as it is driven forward. Pull the trigger to release that striker and blammo. The new Mauser flag safety uses a ramped wafer shape to keep the cocking piece from traveling forward. This is much simpler than that old half rod. Otherwise, this is a very simple gun, easy to understand and reasonably easy to manufacture. Now let's get over to May for a test fire. You know, it's not that beautiful of a gun, but it looks like it worked just fine. And if you're about to send me an email that says, hey, I had a really beautiful Mauser 89 you could have borrowed, you're a little bit late. We spent a year and a half hardcore looking for these guys. And we do have a list out on the site and things of stuff that we're looking for. And I still get emails all the time that's like, oh, I had one of those. Well, the episode's out, it's done. All right, so this is the best we could do, and I still think it did pretty dang fine. Now, in terms of production, Let's talk about the fact that as October 1889 is ramping up, uh, FN, Fabrique Nationale, isn't even being constructed just yet. Instead, the Belgian government is negotiating with Ludwig Love for domestic production. They want the rights to produce the gun for themselves in Belgium. And Ludwig Love is going, yeah, okay, you want to make it MAE, we're fine with that. Um, you know, we'll just license the Belgian government, quote unquote, and sign this paper away. And so... Almost immediately after production got started, I can imagine the Germans were pretty annoyed. Now that the new rifle was ready, tooling could be brought in from the US to set up FN, but issues with converting from Imperial to metric had them turning to Ludwig Lova for help, who was very surprised to see a commercial concern producing their rifle. Now just to refresh you, Mauser owns Mauser Obendorf and put out the design for his rifle and would get, you know, some direct profit on it being used, but Mauser Obendorf is currently owned by a company named Ludwig Lova, like I've been saying. Ludwig Lova is being run by Isidore Lova, the surviving brother, not the one that the company was named for. Don't get too confused there. So Mauser Obendorf and Ludwig Lova are companies. Paul Mauser and Isidore Lova are the people who respectively run them, and Paul Mauser is suborned to Isidore Lova's company, okay? Paul. Now, uh, FN, Fabrique Nationale, once they get set up, they need to buy equipment. They go to America, like I said, they can't get it, so they go over to Germany. The Germans go, what are you doing making this stuff? And now they're kind of stuck because the way everything's been signed off, they can't stop FN from existing and producing this sort of thing and getting set up. But especially the Ludwig Lova company is not that interested in having a large manufacturer of you know, military rifles setting up in Liège. That's a big threat to them. However, they're stuck and they still wanna make the money that they can make that's already out there on the table to be grabbed. And so they'd rather sell them the equipment and have the Americans do it, so they go ahead. And that means FN ends up with a German equipped, very modern, super sleek facility. They had bought up land in the Herstel suburb of Liège. 
and began building an awesome facility. They'd pull in the latest and greatest equipment, including a massive power generator to provide heat and electricity to the plant. This of course took time, wrapping up in December of 1891, with the first three rifles produced just before the year's end. Now by late 1892, production was up to 125 rifles a day, and it would soar up to 250 by the end of the contract, which was completed all 150,000 rifles by New Year's Eve of 1894, which is pretty rapid actually. And they even managed a hefty profit thanks to that original price tag being a little high. So as we'll see over the years, the factory would grow huge, but that's a story for a little later. For now, let's cover some numbers. The original contract was for 150,000 rifles. This was followed in 1895 for 50,000 more, although an unknown percentage of these were carbines. More on that in the next episode. Between 1895 and 1913, 50,000 more were ordered. And in 1913, a final contract of 25,000 units again, probably rifles and carbines, was placed. That makes for a total of 275,000 or so Belgian Mausers of all kinds. Except around 1910, MAE was actually told to begin rifle production of their own, likely meant to displace FN over time to lower that price tag. Perhaps 10 to 20,000 were ordered from MAE, but it's uncertain how many were delivered before the war. Now Belgian Mauser production gets a little wonky because we're going to see some other manufacturers turn up during the war. Uh, that's going to be in our next episode. There's a lot to cover here. But regardless, you're going to start to see some mixing and matching of uh, receiver names and models and stuff like that. A lot of this has to do with post-war rebuilds. And so you can get a little mix of everything. But as we're going into the Great War, we're seeing a high quality rifle, extremely well fit, lower than 2% rejection rate. Uh, beautiful bluing, uh, awesome, awesome gun. And then as we get into the war, things speed up, the bluing kind of goes to crud. You start to see a lot of guns that look a lot like this during the war period. Now, dating them because of the extensive rebuilding that happened during and after World War I is extremely difficult. There is, however, one thing that can give you a slight clue, which is hopefully you still have your stock brand right here on the stock. These stock cartouches give you a clue to when it was produced because if branded in the name of Leopold II, it's probably from 1891 to 1909, if Albert I, 1909 to 1914, and beyond. If nothing is marked there, well, it was probably made during the war and then not refurbished after the fact or somebody sanded on it. Now, if you have a Belgian Mauser and you're noticing that there's a ton of little proofs, like really cool little proof marks all over it. Well, that's the time to get Van der Linden's book because I am not going through all of those. I will point out one curiosity though, that with the original FN made production, generally what you see is a Liège proof house mark on the bolt only. And that's because apparently the government was trusted to produce the rifle and inspect it themselves and it did not need the Liège proof housing except the bolt, because at any point, arguably, you could take this bolt out and put it in a commercial Mauser of the same make, and therefore this is not necessarily always gonna be retained as military equipment, and therefore this needs to be proof checked. Alternatively, they could be proofing the entire gun, but decided it was redundant to mark all the other previously inspected methods, I'm unsure. But Liege marks, the proof house, the commercial proof house marks, only show up on the bolt, which is kinda neat. All right, with production under control, we need to talk about what happens once we start handing these things out. And to do that, we have to first kind of tell you about Belgian riflemen because they were not really the same as the rest of Europe's. Because Belgian, at this point, you know, a neutral nation, well, they didn't maintain a huge army of a bajillion million conscripts. Instead, they had a very strong marksmanship program. Uh, lots of shooting competitions were promoted throughout the country. Uh, these ranged from little small personal ones to just big international events prizes everywhere. It was a big part of the martial culture, and so it drove a country of marksmen. These prominent events ranged from 25 meters out to 600 meters, and the long range was all the rage. Again, this is with iron sights. And by the way, you can see it in this poster, it also included the Garde Civique. This paramilitary civil guard was an offshoot of the 1830 revolution, an amalgamation of various militia groups into one pseudo-military force. We'll talk more about them in detail in another episode, but know that in 1895, they adopted the 1889 rifle for their own use as well. That brought all of Belgium's armed forces into one standard pattern rifle, plus some carbine variations. So that means if you're military or paramilitary in Belgium, you are familiar with this gun and its cartridge out to hundreds of meters to some degree. And then 
when you have a test bed like that, well, you get a higher percentage of people that will show up that actually try and, you know, challenge and push, and they get up to the top, right? And these guys, often known as terriers d'élite, and I'm sorry, I don't speak French, but uh, these guys, the superior marksmen of the group, these guys are essentially iron sight snipers. They are capable of very accurate fire for hundreds of meters with their standard 1889 rifles. So now you have prize winning riflemen in a small neutral nation. And that is going to be extremely handy for someone like Belgium who does not have a lot in the way of, you know, martial experience or heavy equipment, artillery, that sort of things. No, they're going to put a lot onto their individual soldiers when war were declared. If you want to talk about powers that were in the Great War from the start, well, you pretty much have to be Luxembourg to beat out Belgium because August 2nd of 1914, the Germans say, hey man, we are coming through your backyard so that we can kick the French's teeth in. And the Belgians said, uh, nah man, you're gonna have to go around front. And the Germans said, nuts to that. And on the 4th, they came kicking in the door. Now they expected things to go pretty easily because it was all built into their, what is later retroactively known as the Schlieffen plan. The uh, ability to get through Belgium in like three days, four days time, and then just sort of hammer the French along their entire front. That was the way they were going to win this war. Unfortunately, Belgium thought differently. They stood firm against the superior German force and even were willing to destroy their own infrastructure to stall their advance. They had wisely invested in some machine guns as well, keeping them mobile with their own dog cart system. Plus, there was that whole country of marksmen thing we just talked about. So while incredibly outnumbered and out-equipped, the better trained Belgians stalled Germany for 11 days instead of just three, giving France and the Entente time to defend their lines. Belgium also tied down a significant number of German troops during the first few months of the war and never surrendered their limited static line later on, also proving to be a distraction. Now, in this initial violent, highly mobile attack, well, there was a lot of street fighting, and so the rifle turned out to be more useful than you would think. Uh, at this point, early on, the first couple days, Belgian forts are holding, and so, yeah, we're down to man-on-man -man fighting in a lot of places. In that regard, well, the Belgians had every bit as good a weapon as Germany, except for some very minor things. We've seen the Gewehr 98 before, and we'll see it in better detail later. It only offers little technical improvements over this gun. This is still a small bore smokeless cartridge. This is still a, you know, rapid loading, modern, reliable gun. It just lacks by about maybe 5% over the German, and they had not come around to the Spitzer bullet. So at very long range, okay, maybe some problems, but Here's the thing, Belgians were trained for that very long range despite having a bottlenose cartridge, so they're fine. Like, they, they held rifleman to rifleman, the Belgians were doing excellent against what were probably a lot of very fresh German conscripts. So, okay, good, we're doing great in service life of the rifle, and as we get into the war itself, we're going to have to see that Belgium makes a lot of uh, uh, changes because basically most of their country is occupied. That is all for next episode, and so I don't want to give too much away from there. And instead, I'm going to steer the service life away and into the Belgian Congo, where this gun was also used, albeit much more limited in number. The average native soldier in the Belgian Congo was armed with an outdated Albini rifle at the start of this conflict. Some very trusted members, however, and European officers were given Mauser 1889s. This practice actually started with the Katanga police, an elite unit, but they were merged into the larger Belgian paramilitary force publique in 1910. And with that, the larger organization got a taste of the 1889 and bought more, again only for the trusted. During the war, most of the Albinis would be replaced with French gifted Gras single shot rifles, if you're curious. This had more to do with ammunition supply than anything else. Mausers remained rare. Force Publique had skirmishes with the German units in 1914 and in 1915 actual battles around Lake Tanganyika. Later, they would invade German territory in Africa, sparking the mobile war we saw with our Jaeger Buxa episode. Again, in Africa, the 89 did its job. This really is a good modern rifle. It just looks a little wonky because it's the first of the good modern Mausers. 
Maybe maybe we got some issues with this jacket though. Um, that's really the hang holdout because this guy attracts rust, moisture. It can be dented. It can press up on the muzzle if it gets dented. It can change barrel harmonics. That's a little tricky. We're actually going to talk more in the third part of this episode as to why this was done and what the alternative really was. So if you're really curious about the barrel jacket, this was put forward by Armand Meigs in the German 1888 episode we did. Uh, you can review that right now, or you can just hold out and we'll show you the comparison in just a little bit. So uh, outside the barrel jacket, the gun is excellent. It's doing very well in all forms. The Belgians really do love it. And so after the war, despite the fact that there were slightly more modern bolt actions out there, there was no real reason to change over. So the 89 remained standard until the 1930s. Now, uh, you would see around 31, 32, 33 FN halting production and taking it out of their catalog. The dates are not 100% clear. And that's because they were making room for the fact that they knew that the Belgian government was adopting what would become the Model 1935. This was really just a 98 pattern universal short rifle. It was meant to get the Belgians finally up to date and realistically didn't have a huge gain over say a shortened 1889, but you know, thoroughly modern. And again, because the 89 wasn't bad, to save money, a great many Mauser 1889s were modified to fit the new configuration, resulting in the Model 1936. Now, those two guns did not get produced enough to displace this guy. So 1889 long rifles, and especially carbines, more on that next time, were still used all the way through World War II. So this is a two World War gun. Uh, it was perfectly adaptable to the Spitzer cartridge and handled feeding them just fine when they came out in the 20s. Um, and again, it's just a good gun. Like you, It's one of those things where you got just far enough down the modern line that you didn't have to make a changeover later, and yet it does look a little bit odd and a little out of place compared to its brethren later on down. But still, good choice. This is really, by the way, where we start to get to the point where countries that are early adopters of smokeless are hitting the right note. So, you know, the Mauser 1887, the Ottomans adopted it just as it was obsolete. The Kropacek definitely was a gun that showed up just as it was obsolete. But now we're getting to that period where people are making good decisions. This was a very good decision. Uh, Well-liked, well-serviced. Now there would be one post-war modification of this gun, by the way, I should say. You might notice a stacking swivel up here. Again, I hate to kick everything down the road, but we got three episodes to cover. We will say why next episode. So make sure you tune in for that. But in the meantime, let's get over to May and get her opinion on the 1889. All right, once more, we've made room for May and just enough room for, you know, the funny thing is, I think it's the barrel jacket on these. They don't look that big to me. They do look like, I don't know, for me, that looks like a cannon. Like it really does. Yeah, I mean, girth wise, but we're talking about like length, it definitely, I mean, you guys can tell because now you have the reference of the frame of the video, but like whenever I just see one of these on the shelf, I don't think they're as big as they are. And then I hold them up to other guns. I'm like, oh no, there's a 50 inch monster. But um, we have our rifle and then actually you have a shirt. I don't even know if it shows up. Where'd you get that from? Ah, some some firearms museum, maybe up at, at Cody. May have passed it along to me. Yeah, I've got one too. Thank you, Danny. Um, I just wear a lot of these bright shirts though, but I wear it elsewhere, so. Um, Danny, thank you for sending some shirts, and if you guys get a chance, support the Cody Firearms Museum. Now, uh, that very little soft. plug, I know, order a shirt, uh, that plug aside, let's talk about this historical rifle, right? So, let me get this into your hands. Thank you. And as usual, we're going to talk about ergonomics, and in this case, it might actually be kind of unusual, because not a lot of guns look quite like that Mauser. You know, I gotta say, that Canon comment, really and truly, that's what it feels like when I'm looking at it. It's just a mini version of a Canon. Like, that jacketed barrel just makes this gun look bigger than what it actually is. I mean, I still understand, like, it's a 50-inch gun. I don't know. Athias is right. Something about the sizing on this just looks off until you put it next to another gun. You're like, oh, no, this is a honking monster. Like, and it's got the weight to prove it. And, yeah, that's going to wear on you as the day goes on. But surprisingly, the balance isn't too bad on her. My hand sits right onto the rear, under the rear sight. And you know, it's, it's actually quite comfortable. I will give it that. Now, I can't see myself shooting all day with it, like I said, but you know, for part of the day or laying prone, totally could see myself handling that well. And this magazine, well, you know, if it's strapped to my back, I could see this like jabbing into my back, getting a little bit annoying into my, the back of my ribs. But for laying prone, it's not too bad. It lines up right with the trigger guard. So I can't really see that being a problem in terms of like different stances to lay with the gun. Um, 
The action, I will say, is incredibly smooth. Like, I was very surprised. When I was first past this model, I was looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, it's a little bit rough looking. I don't know, I was expecting it to just kind of feel rough too when I handled it, but no. That action is incredibly smooth. And I know you're seeing me struggle with that cock on clothes. I'm not gonna lie, cock on clothes I've come to find are not my favorite as a shooter because when it's cock on open, I mean, I can like, if I'm trying to, and you don't see me do this for the series because when I'm at range, guys, I usually tend to handle like five to six guns through the day and we're out there for several hours. So yes, I'm cycling the gun, the action on at my hip just because it's easier for me in the long run for the whole day for me to be able to shoot. But if I'm just kind of on my own practicing and shooting for fun, I will try to cycle from the shoulder. But for this one, if it were cock on open, you know, I can maybe wedge it under like my armpit or something or like into my arm a little bit better in order to give myself a little extra oomph to pop the bolt open. But for cock on close, you kind of have to push it out of position into your shoulder, out of your shoulder, which I don't really like. I'd rather be able to pull something into me in order to, you know, work against the cock on open versus working against the cock on close, pushing it out of position. That's just a, something I find a little bit uncomfortable about this gun. I will also say there's no grasping groove on this stock. So when she pushes away on this particular model. I just slide, there's just nothing there. And it, I know it's possible the stock was sanded down at some point maybe, but even so, like you can still tell it's a very smooth wood that was used. And so I'm just gonna slip and slide everywhere on this guy. Well, I mean, any gun in good shape, it's not going to give you a lot of purchase. The other thing I find unusual about this gun is that the, because of the barrel jacket, I suppose, I feel like I have a very wide and shallow grip on the forestock. You know, it is interesting. It does kind of want you to know, make you feel like you want to wrap your hands up around, like up into the rear sight almost, which is kind of not where you want to be with your hand. Yeah, I have larger hands. May I borrow that? For me, it's very natural to drop this in and then boom. I mean, I've got my thumb halfway blocking that rear sight, and I don't mean to, I have to consciously put my hand down lower, especially in modern shooting, I think we got a lot of thumb over, and so, you know, I go hang out with the newer stuff once in a while, and I get in this habit of getting my hand over, but, I mean, I am in my own way messing with these sights. So, I'm not sure that I love the forestock on this particular gun. Not that it's horrible, it's just something about it pulls you into just the wrong shape. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep interrupting you. And by the way, uh, May, now that I am interrupting you, May already said that uh, she takes it down for her shoulder just for exhaustion's sake when we're filming for a long day. But there's a secondary part of that too. Uh, a lot of these guns, we don't know what's going on with the condition. So a lot of times both May and I are in a position where we can see the rear action of the gun especially. We wanna see the risk of double feeds. We wanna see if we split any cases and that pause where she's looking down at the gun. She's watching the case most of the time and manages to see whether or not it's obviously damaged. Jay is in charge of watching right where he's at. He's even got glasses if he needs them to see if there's any damage to the case as they come out to make sure that we don't have problems while we're filming. And then my job is generally actually to watch the wrist area of the guns to make sure that we're not developing any cracks or problems that may DQ the gun while we're firing. We get these things in mixed condition and we never want to have a serious accident on this show, never. Uh, and you can test them. We can test 100 rounds out of them. The 101st might be the one where we have some trouble. So if you're into these old guns, I understand it's fun to run matches with them, especially if they're in their pristine condition, but we want to be consistent across what could come in in this condition versus amazing condition. We always triple check everything and it's just our responsibility as custodians to the arms and to the safety of our own crew. We need May to keep shooting. She can't have a Paul Mauser eye incident. So Yeah, I don't want to have to suddenly change which is my dominant eye. I'm really keen on my right eye being dominant, guys. Anyway, uh, excuses for laziness aside. <laughs> let's and go, safety. Let's get back to the ergonomics because I don't even think you've complained about the uh, straight wrist yet, which is your usual MO. You know, he cut me off, so that was literally the next place I was going to. I'm not going to lie, it's especially with this, like, I, I feel like every time I pull this gun into me, it's out of position, whether it's because of the cock on closed bolt, because, like, I don't have anything down here, semi-pistol grip to help me, I've got no, I've got no grasping groove up here, it's just... Everything about this gun, it wants to push and pull itself out of position on me. And I just wish I had at least a semi-pistol grip to kind of give me a little bit of an aid there. But nope, I don't even have that. This gun just does not want me, it just doesn't want to give me any ease of positioning with it. Everything I got to work for on this one. Um, at least the comb, it is on decent height. Like it, it puts you right, your cheek weld right where it needs to be to line up with the sights. And those sights, man, I'm going to get into these into the shooting section because I know I haven't really tapped on these a little bit, but yeah, I'm not super keen on those either.
But yeah, ergonomics aside, I'm surprised at how smooth the action is. I'm surprised about how the balance point on this one was pretty decent, even given the weight. But that barrel jacket makes things a little bit awkward, and I, I don't think that would fare well in the long run for me. Yeah, may I actually borrow that? So, to me, this gun is thoroughly modern. It's got every new feature of 1889, 1890, rolled right into it, right? Fast loading, uh, vertical stack box magazine right in the middle for balance. Uh, we got front locking lug, smokeless powder. This is fresh technology. The problem is they didn't apply any of that extra thought to the actual handling of the gun. It's still a straight wrist, no grasping group. I mean, it's plain. Everything about the stocking in this gun is very plain. The sights, as May is about to talk about, they're very plain. And so it's where the lack of imagination came in that we start to have problems because I agree with May. I get this up here. I'm not sure where to settle my hand in and it's kind of slick. Granted, she did say this gun has been probably sanded in its life, but we have several others that we're going to cover and they're all a little like that no matter the condition. So I'm not sure where to set in my hand and I'm not getting a lot without really putting some weight into it, but you don't want to put a lot of torque into your foregrip. So I fire the gun, I come back, I bolt forward. She wants to come off my shoulder, okay? So she's rocking off my shoulder. I don't, it's hard to hold here, so she's definitely sliding everywhere. I get her forward, right? I wanna settle her back into my shoulder, but I can't just sort of tweak my pinky into doing it with a semi-pistol grip. I gotta bring the whole thing back in and sort of resettle my grip. It's definitely a little slower to follow up only on the ergonomics. And I think this is the kind of gun that really highlights why ergonomics are important. All right, so, with that aside, you want to talk about the sight and you want to talk about shooting that gun, so let's let you get through all that. You know, there's actually something I think Othias forgot to mention in the episode, and that's specifically regarding these sights. These are not Mauser sights. These are sights off of the uh, Belgian Comblane. I noticed that, so... Hmm. Okay, fine. You went. So, it, that is true. I probably should have put it earlier in the episode, and I don't know why it slipped my mind, but those are not Mauser sights. Um, as we'll see later with a certain Ottoman rifle, Paul Mauser sticks with his push button, click and adjust pure ladder sight. This is a friction set sight with a little bit of a tangent, like you can get a couple extra hundred meters marked on there, and then all of a sudden you gotta flip over to ladder mode for long range. Um, but there's no push button, those are just friction set, and as we know, that is very vulnerable to age and deterioration, and of course you can fire and they come loose, or they get gunked up and they become hard to move. Not the best, but apparently Belgium went with it because it's what they knew and they were already trained on. This is all being held over from their single shot Comblain rifle, and we're actually gonna talk about that gun in the future. So you'll get to see both sight types and I'll get you some photos in a moment. But while we're talking about people forgetting things, you know, you did all the ergonomics, you didn't mention the safety. I knew he was gonna do that. I was waiting for it. I was gonna talk about the safety first, so I was like, nah, I've got something here on the ladder sight with him. Oh, and then he brings in the safety. Thank you. Yes, I did forget about the safety. So it's a standard flag safety, but I did notice they put some checkering on here, which makes it really nice and textured for your forefinger and your thumb to flip. So good job on the safety. Why you gotta play me like that? <laughs> all right, well, I think we're caught back up. We've done all the ergonomics. Now you did want to talk about actually using those sights because you noticed something that is a little Lee Enfieldy about them, didn't you? Yes, I did. The notch up here at the front, it's at the front of the sight. It's not back here at the rear. So. Not only am I losing this extra little bit of space that they could have done if they had just moved the notch further back, but also look how much wasted space there is right here between the bolt and where the sight actually is. It's from here to here. And then that means my sight radius, it's only from here to the front to the front sight. Like that's that's such a large amount of space gap right here that they could have utilized and just didn't. So yeah, unfortunately, my sight radius is not where it could be, but I will say those sights are incredibly tall and very easy to read. I just wish they would have utilized the whole length of the gun and actually brought the rear sight a little bit further back. That's just something I noticed they could have done a little bit extra on, but hey, you know, I guess beggars can't be choosers. Yeah, there are carbines out there that have the same sight radius as this rifle. Did we complain about this on the Lee Enfield? Um, and then the Lee Enfield at least had the notch at the rear of the rear sight. This is a mid-position rear sight with the notch at the front. We are losing a lot of length that could be going to use with higher sort of accuracy in terms of reading what we're seeing on the sight. Now, ideally, we would be all the way at the rear with an aperture sight, but not everybody had come around to that idea even by the time World War I started, and we are way before that. So we can forgive 
the rear leaf sight that's mounted to the barrel, it's just that, boy, is it far forward. And a lot of that has to do with the setup of the jacket and things like that. So, okay, we get it. You're not that huge of a fan of the sight, except for the fact that it's very tall and easy to read. But what happens when we start loading and then pulling the trigger on this thing? How's it do otherwise? For loading, it was incredibly smooth. It stripper clip fed all five rounds, very easy for me. Firing the trigger is a very, very clean two-stage trigger. Like, I, I absolutely did love it. There is a long pull through. It's smooth all the way, even through. Heavy cliff, but the brake is very crisp. It's there. It's perfect. So, yeah, big fan of that two-stage trigger. The recoil in this guy, you know, it, you're seeing the gun and you're thinking, God, that's such a big gun. It's got to be a big cartridge coming out of it. No, it's small board. Like, there's really not a big cartridge. 7.65 is not a very big round. Firing out of this gun, it felt perfect. The recoil was recoil was practically non-existent. Like it was there, don't get me wrong, there is some recoil. You can go back and watch the slow motion. I know it's there too. It's just when I go back and watch it, I'm like, was there really that much recoil? I just don't remember it being that significant, which is perfect. That's how you wanna have the gun feel. You don't really wanna feel like there's a lot of a lot being taken out of you and a lot going into you for the recoil. You want it to feel just right, and that's how it felt with this gun. So yeah, shooting wise. I was very surprised. The action again was smooth. The trigger was great. The sights were tall. I just wish I had a little more radius to them. Yeah, I would say if you ran this gun dry and then went out and shot it, you'd be surprised at how well it did once it was actually shooting. Um, the squirminess we complained about aside, 765 Argentine is generally the nickname in the US, even though really it came first in this gun. It's just that we're used to uh, South American imports here. But 765 is a wonderful, wonderful full power cartridge to me. I think it strikes the right balance. It's been one of my favorites for a long time. Out of a gun this heavy, it is fairly negligible recoil. Now you still see that the gun does have recoil and it does pitch up. I think a lot of that has more to do with the lack of support and the ergonomics factor because I've shot 7.65 out of other guns that were a little better laid out and much lighter and it does great. It's a, just a good all around cartridge in my mind. But um, I guess that takes us up to our final question though because we have a mixed review here. Um, there are concerns about the barrel jacket that we talked about being easily dented or wearing over time. Uh, the rear sight isn't our favorite, but we're not exactly using long range all the time. It has a shorter sight radius, but shorter sight radius on a 50 inch long gun doesn't mean much. It's still very clear and easy to read. Uh, she's I'm worried about this magwell being damaged over time with it sticking out like it is. Yeah, that could probably take some wax. Honestly, if you look at this gun, you start to get an idea for why a lot of these went in for rearseling over and over again. Um, thinner stock because of the jacket. The jacket itself is vulnerable. Uh, pinch style sights, which obviously are gonna have to be retuned periodically. Um, and then a magazine that sticks out the bottom. We're inviting a lot of damage to this gun. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not useful or reliable or even rugged to a certain degree. It just means that other designs will last slightly longer to maybe even significantly longer because they've tightened up on the design. But again, first Mauser smokeless rifle. So very early tech. Now. All that said, well, how does this stack up to you in terms of taking into the Great War? Would you do it? You know, honestly, I have said yes to worse guns. So I can't really give a solid reasoning for saying no to this one because my arguments have really just been about the accessories. You know, give me a better sight radius, do uh, the barrel jacket. That's going to be a problem in the long run. Uh, cock on clothes, like the magazine wheel sticking out a little too far. Again, those are all tiny things that do make it a little difficult to handle you know, years into the battle kind of ideal. You know, if it's, I just can't see myself saying no to this though because the action was smooth, the cartridge was decent, I shot well with it, performance wise it didn't give me any problems either. So yeah, I'm gonna have to give this one a yes. It just gets like a, you know, a, a mediocre yes. It doesn't get a strong one. It's not in like my top 10 per se, but I would definitely take this into battle. For my part, I'm gonna give a firm yes. Again, not in my top anything, because this is about as middle of the road as I could get in terms of having acceptable arm, because everything about the mechanism is exactly what I would want, but everything about the dressing, uh, sights, uh, handling, stock, all that sort of thing, is wrong, you know? It's dated dressing, modern action, and so, mm, okay, I get a five shot smokeless powder rifle. At this point in the war, they're not using a Spitzer, although we did use one on the range, I'm sorry guys. Um, so a little bit of a disadvantage there in a 30 cal, because a 30 cal could use a Spitzer more easily than a 6.5, but 
it's not enough. It's not enough to DQ it. Um, I certainly would have confidence in a fight with this gun that it would deliver the goods. So yeah, I'd have to go with a yes on the Belgian 89. All right, so uh, unless you have anything else to add, I think that wraps us up. Are you good? No, I think I'm good for the evening. Okay. Well, then next time we're going to talk about, well, obviously we always do these two-parters like this. We're going to talk about the shorter version of this gun. I mean, if you have watched any of our shows, you know that's where we're heading. But because there's so much history built around this uh, and being the first smokeless rifle, this is going to see a third part in which we look at another country's version of this gun and one more variant of the Belgian. Uh, hopefully we'll bring you a lot of stuff that you don't actually know about this system in the next couple episodes. And hopefully it'll help us pull ahead on production too, because it was kind of nice to find something that was a big glut of information that we could really Oh yeah, you out. basically just got to research all about this gun and it's beginning and end. Yes, and thanks to Vanderlinden, a lot of it was in English for once. So uh, you guys should definitely check out that book. There's so much information there above and beyond what you've heard today. All right, so thank you all for tuning in and stay after the credits for any updates. And we're always glad to have you. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right, guys, update time. And there's two things to really discuss, as there always are, because there's two ways we fund this show. One is with the little merch that we do every once in a while on a limited run, which uh, I want to make sure I say something very clearly. We produce that stuff in lots. We can never really guarantee exactly how long it takes because it depends on when Indiegogo pumps out the funds and then when distributors get us the stuff. And then there's always, let's be fair, we, we live in a world that is not perfect. There's always some error of some sort. A number of orders will get eaten by customs departments or there'll just be a size that's wrong. When that kind of thing happens to you, just email us. I, I Sometimes I hear from people months later and uh, they're like, commenting to someone else that they had a hard time. And every time I get disappointed because every email I've ever gotten that was uh, a worry or complaint about something that you ordered from us, I have done my best to run it all the way down. And I don't think I've had anybody walk away without getting exactly what they requested. Because, I mean, it's practically why we're able to get as big as we have gotten is because we always follow up with our promises. I do not break my promises to you guys at home. All right, so uh, in addition to that, speaking of promises... We, uh, we have another arrangement that we have, which is that every month a certain amount of money shows up, and then every two weeks episodes go out. That is through Patreon. Yeah, seriously, guys. Y'all's patron supporters are the lifeblood of the show. Y'all are the reason we're able to keep doing what we do every single month. Yeah. Uh, again, good funds, big funds that come in with these like special projects, we throw it at special problems. Oh, yeah. They're super useful. We're throwing at something like a big thing we need to purchase in terms of like a bunch of equipment at once or one or two really rare guns that we can't normally get with the normal patron funds every month. Like they're just they're great for those big snatches. And yep. then the patrons are great for the normal everyday stuff. Like one of the cameras breaks. We need to replace it. Uh, we got to do our regular payments, you know, to keep our animator and our ammo going. You know, it's it. They're both really essential for the show. Yeah, they run almost separately in a way, except when we run out of special funds, we then have to pull out of the patron funds and I eat ramen. So um, we're not, it's interesting. With the special campaign, we are pretty much funded, but the problem is we can't always count on those to be successful. It kind of depends on a bit of luck and a bit of me designing things correctly that you guys really want. Uh, Patreon makes us feel way more secure. So that is the place to go if you want to support the show on the daily. You want to help us, I mean, really, money buys time. I mean, that's that's really what it is. Is If I can get time back on my schedule, if I can bring in, say, May full time, then that frees up enough hours in my week that I can do special projects like five-minute episodes on why point-blank range is the way it is. You know, just little factoid things that I want to put out. I always have these ideas and no time to follow up on them. So that's what Patreon is for, is to sort of enable us to keep spreading. And I hope that what people have seen is the more we've grown in funding, the more we've grown the show. I really want that to be apparent across the board. All right, so again, thank you however you support the show. Even if it's just hitting a like or subscribe or telling a friend, it doesn't have to be monetary. We just want to grow and we want to share this history message with more people. That's the end goal of everything. So if you're just telling others, that's fine. That's actually the heart of what we want. All right, have a good one, guys. Thanks.